Good morning, Movement Church. Oh, I love it. I love it. Y'all are so enthusiastic. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, I want to welcome those of you also that are online joining with us. Hey, it's not too late to share the feed and ask somebody maybe that you think of that might be at home too in their jammies and invite them to come and join the service as well. And uh, speaking of inviting, I uh, want to encourage some of you, if you uh, have invited somebody today, uh, maybe lean over to them and ask them if they would text new to MC to the number 94000. Or if you came on your own today and this is your first time with us, or maybe you've come a few times but you haven't, uh, you know, you haven't been wanting to quite engage yet, uh, I would encourage you text new to MC to the number 94000. Uh, so that we can connect with you. We want to share a few things with you, have, uh, help you get to know us a little bit. And if you're new, if you haven't stopped by the Welcome Center, we would encourage you to do that as well. We have a gift that we would love to give you. So please do that. And of course, for you veterans, you already know what I'm going to say. Uh, don't forget about our display out in the foyer there with the ping pong balls. If you invite somebody to come and see what God's doing here at Movement Church, we would encourage you, bring them over to that display. Grab one of those blue ping pong balls and say, hey, write your name on there because we've been praying for you. And it's so exciting to know when somebody uh, comes and visits and, and checks things out to see what God's doing here. And if you're out and about in the places where you live, work, and play, and you have a gospel conversation with someone, if you share the reason for the hope that you have in Christ with another person, we want you to write their name on that ball and drop it in there because we get to look at those and know that those aren't just ping pong balls in that display. They represent lives and stories and people that God loves. And so we pray for them and we see them. We're encouraged by them. Uh, so we would encourage you to please do that because you know uh, one of our core values here is compelling faith. And when you have an encounter with the creator of the universe and, and, he know, and you know him by name and he knows you by name, uh, it creates a faith that's compelling. And we want to encourage you to share that faith with others by inviting them to come and see and inviting you to go and tell them about that. And so, amen? All right. Hey, with that, would you all stand and let's worship together this morning? Shout out your praise. Oh, we 
sorry to do this, but I'm going to ask you to sit down for just a moment. I never want to sit down after that song, but I'll tell you this. We are going to continue celebrating uh, and worshiping because this is that time in the service when we invite you to worship with your gifts, with your giving. And uh, today, what I want to do is maybe to celebrate a little bit with you some really cool things that God has been doing uh, that oftentimes 
happen because you give. I just found out I was talking with uh, Pastor Seth this morning, and uh, he sent out a text a couple of days ago and let us know our student, while our students were at camp that we had four students that went to camp with Movement Church that made decisions to follow Christ Woo! while they were gone. That is four people that have entered into the kingdom, four people who life with Jesus started right on that day and continues forever. Um, what an amazing thing. And, you know, we just had uh, little guys that were at camp a couple of weeks ago. We had wind shaped camp and we've seen lots of students that have made important decisions and rededicated their lives. And they've had these, these kind of mountaintop experiences. And that's, that's what camp is for, uh, for a lot of students and for a lot of little guys. It's a mountaintop experience. And the mountains are great, right? We, we want to go visit the mountains. We want to be up there and we want to see what God's doing and just survey the beauty that's all around us, right? But here's the really cool part, and this is what I love about Movement Church. Mountaintops are great, but fruit grows in the valley. And those students are going to be coming home, right? And it's going to be, you know, back to life as it was before camp, right? Except it doesn't have to be that because there's ministry that takes place here. And it's the same for us in our lives. When we have a mountaintop experience, the fruit grows in the valley. The fruit grows during those everyday moments that we experience. And when we experience them in honest community and we experience them at a place where we are constantly at the feet of Jesus, right? And when our students can come back to a place where there are adults that love them, where they can come back to a place where there's ministry that's happening and discipleship that's taking place, the fruit begins to grow, right? And we get to see this happen time and time and time again and we get to celebrate together and a lot of this happens because you guys are sitting out there saying you know I, I want to give to that I want to I want to invest in what God's doing in and through his people here at Movement Church and, and, and in the community and all over the world and so I want to encourage you today as you give celebrate as you purpose in your heart to give cheerfully celebrate that fact knowing that there are four people whose lives have been forever changed forever transformed. What an amazing thing we get to be a part of. Amen? Uh, if you would like to join us in that today, if you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. Uh, if you're the, the old-fashioned uh, cash or check kind of giver, you could do that. There should be somewhere near one of the seats in front of you. There should be a little envelope there that you can place that in uh, and drop it in one of the corner boxes in the foyer that's out here. If you'd like to give online, there's some instructions behind me up on the screen. But would you pray with me as we just bless this time of offering? Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God, indescribable, in fact. God, thank you for what you've done. God, thank you for those four souls, God, that, that, whose lives are changed. God, thank you that you are working, that you have worked and will continue to work in and through your people here at Movement Church and in our community. Pray that you would take these gifts today and bless them do things with them beyond what we could ever even imagine. And we'll give you all the glory for it. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, let's stand. Let's continue worshiping this morning.
You are the only one worthy of eternal praise. You are faithful when we are unfaithful. You are always there. Even when we forget you, you're always there waiting for us to come back to you and to praise you and to give you everything that we are. God, I pray that we will do that, that we will give everything that we are to you in praise and in offering to you a living sacrifice because you are worthy. That's all there is to it. You are worthy. And even including giving your son to die for us, to save us from our sin. You gave us so much, even though we are unworthy. So God, help us to praise you and to honor you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, Movement Church. How are you guys doing this morning? It is great to see you. Glad to have you joining us online as well. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you where we are. You've got it figured out by this point, right? Uh, Walking through the life of David. Uh, I did ask in the first service just to make sure. I'm I'm wanting to do kind of a temperature check to make sure you guys are still good. We haven't switched up a series in the past couple of weeks. So is everybody still good? We're all right. Clicking along with David. You're still getting a little something out of it, even if it's just good nap time. Yes? (laughs) I just want to make sure because, you know, we got to check those things. And maybe you're like, well, I don't want to say publicly. You can send me an anonymous email. That's fine. And I'll put it in my anonymous folder. Um, (laughs) Anyway, we are back into 1 Samuel. Today we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you want to go ahead and start turning there, or those of you joining us online, you can go ahead and pull that up on the uh, tab at the top. But um, David, a man after God's heart, a man pursuing God's heart consistently, regularly. Uh, Last week, we left David in 1 Samuel 25, dealing with his dummies, right? Uh, And to kind of soften it, those those dummies are those people who, uh, at times in our lives, we feel like we've poured into them, we've invested into them, and it just seems as though their response is foolish. It seems disconnected, and we find ourselves frustrated. And What we learned by looking at that interaction last week, not so much from David, but from what God ended up doing in David, was first that we can't let emotions drive our decision making. We cannot allow emotions emotions to become the sole factor in our decision making. Now, we don't ignore those emotions, which is actually what we're going to talk about a little bit today, but we don't let them become the deciding factor. We also don't project on and punish the many for the offense of one. We don't throw on everybody else what one person did. And ultimately, we allow God to deal with those who are fools in our lives. Those that we find ourselves so deeply confused and frustrated by. Let's, let's pray for them 
instead of plotting against them. Now, to catch us up to speed, uh, again, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So we're we're passing through a few uh, chapters, but I want to get you up to speed. Chapter 26 is pretty straightforward. Uh, David spares Saul again. So we had another open door, right? But hopefully you remember this from a few weeks ago. Every open door is not always God's will. So there's another open door, an opportunity where David can actually take Saul's life, but he doesn't. And after verse 20, or chapter 26, we get into chapter 27, which admittedly is a little sketchy. You ought to go read it if you get the chance to uh, sometime later today or this week. But David ends up taking refuge with the Philistines. So that's a little weird. Amen? Amen. Okay, some of y'all haven't been paying attention. Um, David takes refuge with the Philistines. Okay. Um, Anyway, it's a little odd. Now, and you may say, well, why aren't we walking through that? Well, I can explain it to you pretty simply. Achish, uh, the king, um, uh, the high leader that David goes to, uh, that he speaks with, Achish is aware of the fact that David and Saul are on the out. So really and truly, he's probably just kind of embracing that old proverbial mindset of the enemy of my enemy is my Exactly. See, some of y'all knew that way too well. Um, But he's just kind of embracing this mindset of, listen, we'd rather have David kind of, quote unquote, on our side than against us. And so Achish takes him in and he gives him a city to call his own. David and all of his men and their families. Uh, Achish gives to David this city, Ziklag, this village, Ziklag. And so that's where they set up camp. That's where they live. Ultimately, as we get into 28 and 29, we find that many of the Philistine princes are not happy about this. And they go to Achish and Achish says, okay, okay, okay. And he says, David, listen, I gave you what I gave you, but you're going to have to stay away. We can't do this. This isn't a partnership that's going to work. David knows it. Achish knows it. And that brings us to where we are today. Now, last week, we talked a bit about our emotions and the role that they play in our lives. And today, we're going to build on that. Today, we're going to build on that just a bit further as we look at what takes place in 1 Samuel 30. But first, I want to ask a question, a survey. All of you in the room, all of you online, should this should be 100% participation, I would say. But how many of you have ever had a bad day? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about. One of those days where you wake up and your clothes are still wet in the dryer. You go to pour some milk on your cereal and you get cottage cheese instead. Your hair ends up looking like this. You end up catching every red light on the way to the work. And it seems like your boss just yells at you all day. All day. So you head back, catch every red light. Your dinner ends up looking like something out of a Jordan Peele horror movie. Because you had to tend to the still wet dryer clothing. Can anybody relate to that, right? And you're just done. You're done. Just a bad day. How many of you had a bad day today and we're not even halfway through? Some of you are like, yes, that is me. But if we move from bad day, then we, then we get to those days that genuinely really are worse than a bad day. We get to those days where it's not just wet clothing in a dryer. It's the loss of a job or a friend family member. We get to those days where it's not a boss yelling at us, but it's a doctor giving us a diagnosis. And it's not just a bad day. It's, it's worse than a bad day. You ever had one of those? And then there's a whole different level altogether. It's not just a bad day. It's not just worse than a bad day. It is the worst day ever. And some of you today, you can relate to that. Because as the timeline of your life goes, it feels like where you are right now is the worst day ever. Some of you, you feel like your worst day ever is behind you, and yet there is a part of you waiting for the proverbial shoe to drop because you feel like there's a worst day coming. And so today, as we look at David, as we examine, again, his life and his responses and the way God moves and works in his heart, we're going to discover how it is we deal with our worst day ever. 
That's what we're going to uncover. Because if we look at this text, catch with me what's going on here. When David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, Ziklag, that's where they make their home now. I told you a moment ago. The Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. This is getting bad. They had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. So the women and the children. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Get that image in your minds. David and probably about 600 men at this point, they were traveling home. The estimate is probably three days nonstop to get back to Ziklag from where they had just been engaged in battle. They're tired. They're hungry. They want to come home to their own beds. You know what that feels like, right? Maybe to a home-cooked meal. They're missing their wives. They're missing their children. So all of a sudden, they come to this place where there's a surprise when as they near Ziklag, no one runs out to greet them. No children with the small voices crying out, Daddy's home! Daddy's home! No wives coming out to say, Sweetheart! And then they notice what appears to be pillars of black smoke billowing on the horizon. And knowing that something is not right, they pick up their pace only to find their homes reduced to piles of ash and their families gone. David's been through a lot up to this point. Yes? We've seen it. We've witnessed it. We've gotten to read in his life. He, he's been through a lot. He's had a bad day. Mark, where a brother said to him, his actual brother said, there is evil in your heart. That's a bad day when a sibling talks to you like that. Amen? He's had worse than a bad day where his boss tried to pin him to a wall with a spear. That's worse. But to call this a bad day would be a gross understatement. This is, in fact, David's worst day ever. So what did he do? What do we do? On our worst day. What do we do in those moments that it feels as though this is the most challenging situation, the most difficult battle, the most painful experience we've ever had to face? What do we do on our worst day? And the first thing that we can see, the response that we see in David and even in his men as they come to this moment is an understanding we need to grasp. And that's this, on your worst day, remember this, living by faith does not mean living without feeling. So remember last week we talked about don't, don't ignore the feelings, but don't let them drive your decisions. The fact of the matter is many times in the church, we confuse faith with not actually feeling what we're going through. Well, I've just got to have the joy of the Lord. Everything's great. <laughs> right? Living by faith does not mean living without feeling. And we know this to be the case. We get to witness, witness this in David's life. If we look at, look at verse 4. Look at the response that David has to this news. Then David and the people who are with him... Let's all do as it says. They did what? Raised their voices. They raised their voices and wept. They didn't just weep. They wept until they had no more strength to weep. On your worst day, you need to remember that God created us as emotional beings. And to choose to keep those pent up and hidden away from the world around us, from those closest to us, is to go against the very thing he has created us to be. I say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's how he made us. 
We know this to be true. Look at Genesis chapter 126. Go all the way back to the beginning. Then God said, let us make man in what? And after our likeness. In the beginning, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Holy Spirit said, let us design, create, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Now, let's be clear. That does not mean that when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, that what you see there, that that image, that that is the God of the universe. Somebody say amen. (laughs) Despite what some may think, that is not the case. What it means to say, let us create man in our image and our likeness, it means that there are certain pieces of who we are in our human experience that are in fact divine by nature. You with me? Then in our human experience, there are things God placed within us, one of those being our emotions. That's what it is to be in his image, in his likeness. That manifestation, that display of emotion is to be like God. If you don't believe me, just go to scripture. Read the Old Testament. You will see time and time again, you'll see the anger and the wrath of God. More specifically, we see it described, move from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5 that God's anger comes to those who refuse to obey him. It upsets him when we choose not to obey what he said. You see, many times we go so far as, oh, God's just a loving God. God can still love you and be angry at the fact that you're not doing what he asked you to do. No amen to that one at all. Just kind of a little loving nod and pastor, move on. (laughs) Right? We read that. That's straight from scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that the Holy Spirit grieves. And that we can actually be the ones that cause that grieving. We know this, that the book of Psalms chapter 2 revealed to us a God who laughs. That's pretty cool. Now, the sad part is that his laughter is usually at our vain efforts to accomplish something. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. But nonetheless, God laughs. We see this joy, this sadness, this hurt on and on. God is a God of emotion and we are created in his image. Then you go on, you look. John chapter 11. How many of you grew up in the church, like from a little kid? How many of you? Several of you. So you remember this. Maybe it was VBS. Maybe it was Sunday school, something like that. You can remember when they would have the memory verse challenge. Go home, memorize a verse, and you get a blow pop, right? (laughs) Or whatever it was. I don't know. But go home, memorize a verse. And what did we all do? We ran home, and we did our best to memorize John 11.35. And we came back and we were like, where's my blow pop, right? (laughs) Jesus wept. And we laugh at that. But listen to me. The shortest verse in scripture as we have it in our English translation, Jesus wept. Let's not miss the impact of those words. Let's not miss God in the flesh moved to tears. Jesus wept. Moved to tears at the loss of a friend. Moved to tears at the lack of faith of those who had called upon him. He was emotional as he walked this earth. And hear me, sometimes the the best thing, sometimes the only thing you can do on your worst day is to cry. A little Maybe a whole lot. Sometimes the fastest way to healing. Hear me. Sometimes the fastest way to healing is actually brokenness. The quickest route to strength is weakness. In our tears. So we see that God is an emotional God. We see the emotion of God. But we also see the response of God to our emotion. Psalm 145, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cry and saves them. Job 34, he hears the cries of the needy, of the afflicted. Psalm 116, David writes this, he listens to my voice and my cries for mercy. Isaiah 38 verse 5 tells us of a God who literally sees with his eyes our tears. 
Now, when our babies are babies, I've got a picture here of my oldest holding his little sister right after she was born. Like this perfect, beautiful picture, all is calm and serene. But, but you know as well as I do, right, that, that babies, when our babies are babies, they have to communicate with us. And the only real form of communication that they have is a cry. Like Canaan crying in his sister Karis' face when they were babies. Pack up off me! I don't know what he was saying, but probably something like this. But when they're babies, they cry. They cry for a diaper change. They cry because they're hungry. They cry because they're tired and exhausted and worn out. And then as they grow, that cry turns to verbalizations. It it turns to words. It, it, It turns to statements of mommy, right? When they want something or need something. With me, daddy was quick. It was daddy, daddy, daddy. That's how they said it. Daddy. And then they, they become teenagers, right? And they still, they, they use their words. Sometimes they use their words and they're dad, you know, or they want mom's attention. And it's like Stewie from Family Guy. Mom, mama, mommy, mom, mama, mom, mama, mommy, mommy, mom, mom, mom. Whatever it is, they, they begin to use those words to convey what it is they need. And then we respond and say, okay, give me just a minute. I'll help you out. Yeah, let me help you out. Or sometimes we go to our happy place. And just ignore them. Um, Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But because they begin to use their words as they are older, when we hear a loud cry or a scream, our response is very different. Because they now use their words to communicate with us pretty regularly. Anytime there's some sort of shout or cry, we respond differently. Like Canaan running around on the pool deck at home and he catches the edge of the guard and it peels the skin off of his toe. And we hear, (laughs) the response is different. Mama Sita runs immediately. She moves to the sound of a cry to offer comfort and help. God hears your cry. Not only does God hear your cry, he sees those tears. And oftentimes he is, hear me, he is quicker to respond to that brokenness than to the pride that says, I'm fine. It's how he created us. It's how he designed us. So we need to stop trying to pretend everything is fine when in fact what we really need is to fall apart in the Father's arms. And listen, let me just say this. Maybe for the manly men in the room today. (laughs) Or the womanly women still don't know what that means. It just doesn't work. But maybe you're someone who says, well, I don't do that. Again, especially if you, if you do happen to be a man who says, well, I don't do that. I don't cry. I need God to hear me, but I don't cry. I just throw this out. Until you, like David, have killed a bear and a lion and a giant and led 600 men into battle I don't want to hear, I'm a man, I don't cry. Really? Or I'll take it a step further. How about this? John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Until you step down out of the majesty of heaven and walk this earth perfect and sinless in every single way and then willingly stretch out your arms and die on a cross for the sins of the entire world. I don't want to hear. I'm a man. I don't cry. We need to show those emotions. We need to recognize that to live by faith doesn't mean to live without feeling. And let's move on. Let me say this, which leads to our next point. Don't confuse, I'm going to say this, 
Don't confuse expressing emotion with wearing them on your sleeve. Okay? Because there's got to be a balance here. Don't, don't confuse the two. God is a God of emotion. Amen? Amen. But God is not a drama queen. Amen. All right? Well, it just got warm in here. I'm going to get some water. <laughs> hey, listen, don't write that down. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't post that on Instagram. My pastor said God is a God of emotion, but he's not a drama Hey, listen, if you want a better way to say it, uh, how about this? There is a difference between sorrow, which is a temporary emotional response, and bitterness, which is an enduring emotional state. I'll say it again in case you do want to write that one down. I'll slow down. <laughs> there is a difference between sorrow, which is a temporary emotional response, and bitterness, which is an enduring emotional state. One is healthy, and God invites us to engage in that. The other, not so much, which leads us to this. On your worst day, remember, living by faith doesn't mean living without feeling. But on your worst day, living with feeling does not mean lingering. It doesn't mean you camp out in that singular emotion and stay there. Because let's be honest, some of us push all the emotion down, some of us don't know anything to do except spill it everywhere <laughs> all the time and live in it constantly. You've experienced a painful loss. You've, someone has hurt you. You've been wounded deeply. Go ahead and be broken. Amen? Amen. Cry a lot if need be. Cry. But then stop. I can't, the same response in the first service. I'm trying to say it compassionately, but it just doesn't come. Let me try it softer. Cry a lot if you need to, but then stop it. <laughs> See, I just can't do it. Then now it just comes out condescending. There's a balance there and I can't find it. <laughs> David took the time to weep. In fact, we read there in verse 4, he wept a long time. Not only did he weep a long time, but he wept what? Loudly. He cried to the top of his lungs. It was full on ugly cry. It was mascara and snot. And I don't think David was wearing mascara. Maybe he was. But it was just, it was a mess. All of it. He wept. He was upset. He was broken to the point that it says in verse 4 that his strength was completely sapped. But then, not two verses later, we read this in verse 6. But David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. He cried. He wept. He expressed that emotion. But then he strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. I love that word right there in the Hebrew for strengthen. It's a beautiful one. It is chazak. Chazak. And it means all of these things listed here. So we could read it as David became mighty in the Lord. He powerful in the Lord. David was made stronger or strengthened in the Lord, right? All of these different things. David, I like this one. David recovered in the Lord. You need to circle that one right there. Because the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people that know how to have emotion, but they don't know how to recover from that emotion. There are a lot of people that go from living a life with emotion to living life in emotion. They just stay there. David recovered. He overcame. But the one I love the most, many of your translations may say this, it actually reads this way, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yes, he was made stronger. Yes, he recovered. Yes, he overcame. But he encouraged. And don't miss this. Who did David strengthen? Who did David encourage? Not a trick question. Who was it? Himself. Catch it. His best friend Jonathan isn't around right now. Catch this. In this moment, David didn't have his family around. 
There, there wasn't really anybody there. You're like, well, Nate, he had all of his men. No, because if you go back in this very verse and read what happens before he encouraged himself, look at what it says. David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. They spoke of stoning him because all the people were what? Bitter in soul. They were broken over their loss and they said, David, this is on you, man. This is all your fault. This is because of what you did. And so as they're screaming at him and yelling at him and telling him, David, you're such a jerk. And now we've lost everything. David's just like, man, I don't know what to do. And so David goes over and he sits in the pile of ashes that used to be his house. He grabs some ice cream and some chewy chocolate chips ahoy. And he says, I don't don't know what to do, but it's just not fair because it wasn't all my fault. I'm not the one who burned it down. I mean, I was mad at me. Right, my family's gone and my kids are gone. Right, my, house is my house burned down too. I don't know. <laughs> no. That's not what David did. And what's hilarious is that many of us, that's what we do on a bad day. I just can't believe my clothes are still wet in the dryer. This day is ruined. (laughs) This was his worst day. And David said, no, you know what? I can't do this. You know why? Because David understood this. He understood that there are times you have to strengthen yourself in the Lord. You have to encourage yourself. David reminded himself of the times that God had been faithful before. David reminded himself of the victories that had been won at the hand of God before. David reminded himself of a dead bear, of a dead giant, of a dead lion. David reminded himself of how God had protected him from Saul. He did this, and hear me. There won't always be and can't always be someone there to pat your back and push you through. There just won't. There won't always be someone there to pray for your healing or for your family. Someone to lift you up. At times, the only person that can encourage you the way you need encouraging is you in the Lord. There are times that nobody else knows what to say. And you're going to have to decide what you need said to you and then say it. Y'all, you said whatever. Y'all are just like, oh, well, praise the Lord. It's time to go eat at Perkins. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> you, and you may be hearing this and you say, Nate, but how? How do you encourage yourself in the Lord? Well, we'll catch this. I'm glad you asked. Verse 7 tells us. We see that as he did this, come on, move along here. David said, catch this. This is interesting. In, in the English, it's a biathar. In Hebrew, it's aviathar. That's how you would say it. But Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, he says to him, bring me the what? The ephod. Now, some of you here, some of you online, you may be saying, wow, that's a great request. Is it, what's an ephod? <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is that a biscuit? Because I could go for a biscuit right now. Is that... Is that a weapon? What was David asking for? An ephod, quite simply put, is a priestly robe or a garment of praise. As he was surrounded by bitter souls and he himself was in the midst of the worst day ever, David made a choice. He didn't just crack open a chicken soup for the soul book, try to encourage himself. He didn't go stand in front of a mirror and say, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. (laughs) This wasn't self-talk that was going on. The Bible says he put on a garment of praise and he encouraged himself, what? In the Lord. Nate, how do I encourage myself? Stop talking so much about your stuff. And start worshiping the God who's over all of it. Nate, that's hard. 
Yeah. Who said it was supposed to be easy? When, when did you sign a contract in Christianity that said this was going to be easy? And if you did, you got sold a lemon. Because it's not easy. Yes, this is a difficult thing. But in the midst of a desperate situation, David put on praise and God responded. Verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, great line, underline it, highlight it. We're going to come to that in a couple of weeks, how important those words are, because we see it over and over. David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? God answered, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out. And the 600 men who were with him. Isn't it interesting Ah, that the same men who were just about to stone him a moment earlier, as soon as he puts on praise and turns his eyes heavenward, now all of a sudden the same ones who wanted him dead are saying, fall in line, let's go. Yo, come on now. That's powerful. And they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. Now, this isn't in your notes. It's just a note that I felt impressed to share with you. And it's this, that word, that brook, that valley, Besor, it comes from the Hebrew Besar. Interestingly, which means good news or glad tidings. And I felt impressed to throw this out for your encouragement today. As hard as it may be to grasp, That when you are going after the heart of God, when you pursue him with everything within you, don't be surprised if on your absolute worst day, you have to walk through someone else's good news. Don't be shocked if in your most difficult situation, as you're going after what God has said, now go, if you don't have to encounter someone else's glad tidings. Which leads to this last thing, and we'll close. On your worst day, remember, living by faith does not mean living without feeling. On your worst day, living with feeling does not mean lingering or staying there. But on your worst day, take back what's yours. Take back What God has rightfully blessed you with. The things that he's placed in your life and said they are yours to steward, to take care of. Go take that back. Don't just settle for the fact that the enemy came and burned it down. And now, oh well, it is what it is. I've seen too many great, amazing, well-meaning Christ followers who fall into these emotional traps where they've experienced a loss or a difficult, really difficult time. And then they just settle. This is it now. This is just life. Hear me. Hear my heart when I say this. If the enemy, if you're here today, And the enemy has taken your peace. Take it back. It's not his to have. Some of you right now, listen, I'm going to say it again, babe. If the church would get as militant about the things of God as they do about positions in political parties. What? Look, look. What if, I'm just throwing out a scenario here. What if we campaigned for people who are the followers of Christ to take back their peace as much as we campaign to take back presidencies? She lets me know if I'm going to get cut afterwards or not. Right now, listen, to, hear me. I'm not saying those things don't matter, but hear me. They don't matter. <laughs> hey, 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 let me let you in. You're like, yes, they do matter. No, no, no. I've already read the back of the book. We win. <laughs> hey, even more importantly, I've already read the back of the book. He wins. 
And if you're living in a constant state of fear and concern and worry, it's because the enemy came and burned down your camp, and it's time for you to go to war and take back your peace. Well, Nate, I'll only have peace if. No, you have peace. He's a person. His name is Jesus. It, listen to me. I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. I just feel like, ah! Listen, hear my heart when I say this. If he snatched your home, take it back. Amen. Like, I don't know what to do with my kids. Inquire of the Lord. Lord, are those my kids or are they the enemies? Do we know the answer? Take them back. If your finances are out of control, take them back. Like, Nate, it's not that simple. You're exactly right. It's not that simple. You'll still have to go to war, just like David did. But you can have the confidence after having inquired of the Lord that he is the one there with you. If the enemy has ripped through the seams of your marriage, take it back. Stop settling for the cultural dispositions of this world that say, well, things just don't work out sometimes. No, you say this will because what God has joined together, let no man separate. <laughs> now hear me. Because I know, I know some of you are going to say, but Nate, my marriage, I, I understand. But I can guarantee you that the vast majority of marriages, they end in separation and divorce. It is not because there's a legitimate reason. It's because someone didn't fight. There are cases that are outliers. I want to confess that so you don't walk away wounded. There are cases where real hurt and real abandonment and real abuse have taken place. I get that. But a lot of times we call abuse what's really just offense. If he's stolen your joy, take it back. Not his to have. But Nate, what if? Stop right there. Because that's exactly what gets us in trouble every single time. What if? Go back to verse 8. We see after David struck them down, twilight until the evening of the next day, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted on camels and fled. David recovered everything. Verse 18 says, everything the Amalekites had taken, David recovered it. But look at verse 8. David inquired of the Lord, and God answered. Nate, but what if? If God has answered, God is with you. And I can promise you, you don't need to pray about, well, does God want me to have my joy? Does God want me to have my peace? What? What? There's no, you don't need to pray about that. That's a given in the Christian walk that he wants you to have his joy and his peace. I can tell you it's a given apart from those conditions that, yes, I alluded to. But it's a given that he wants your marriage to be strong and thriving. Why? Because it's a testimony of him and his church. He wants that. So you don't need to pray, God, is my marriage supposed to work out? Yes. God, am I supposed to have joy? Yes, he's answered. And he said, I'm with you. I can remember when all of my kids got to ride a roller coaster for the first time. The coolest thing was every single one of my kids, they just hopped right on and rode. They just jumped on and rode it. They, they, uh, they hopped on this one when they were barely tall enough to ride it. This is Wild Eagle up at Dollywood. It's one where you hang off the edge of the tracks. Love that. Who loves roller coasters? Who hates them? Your palms are sweating right now just looking at this. I get it. I'm with you. Uh, this is what this is Velocicoaster just over at Universal. It's just a couple years old. That one is intense. I'm still recovering from the times that I've ridden it. That's what I get for being old, I guess. Uh, this one, we took this every time that they rode their first roller coaster. This is Kane in his first time on Rock and Roller Coaster. He was barely five years old. Uh, and we may or may not have stuffed his shoes just a little bit. <laughs> But here's what's fascinating. My kids would get on that coaster, and the way it would happen was all due to one reason. My wife 
told them what was coming. They said to mommy, mommy, what's this going to be like? They inquired. And mom responded, it's going to be a little scary. It may even make your tummy feel kind of crazy. But you're going to make it through it. And I'll be with you. And so they would ride the ride every single time. They got off. They looked right at us and said, let's do it again. (laughs) But they would follow up with, but mommy, will you ride with me? She was the first one. She rode with all of our kids the first time they rode a coaster like that. She's a brave woman. (laughs) Or I'm a smart man. I don't know which it is. (laughs) But they would get off and they say, will you be with me? You inquire of the Lord and he assures you. That's what happened here in David's life. Same for you today, even on your worst day. Take it back. There are going to be times that God says, nope, that's not yours to take back. Things that you think. And listen, let me tell you this. There are going to be times that you're going to cry, then you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord, and then the Lord's going to say, it's okay, go ahead and cry again. This is not a one, two, three step, okay? This is just a look at how we can respond when it just seems it can't get any worse. Father, we pray that as we leave from this place, our hearts would be encouraged. That as we leave from this place, we would be a people some of whom who are perhaps in their worst day right now, that we would know we have permission to feel. But that we would also know that we serve a God who longs to carry us out of those feelings that we might experience something better. Your comfort in the midst of and through our pain. That we might experience the victory of the one who longs for nothing more than for us to take back our joy, to take back our peace, to take back our homes and our marriages and our children. Lord, let us leave with here with a militant spirit for the things of God. We love you. We praise you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. We love you so much. I do want to remind you, uh, if you, if you weren't in early enough to hear it, uh, we had four students come to know Christ at camp this past week. <laughs> amen. If you hadn't heard this news at Windshape just a couple of weeks ago, we actually had 18 students come to know Jesus Christ, 18 kiddos come to know Christ, which is amazing. That said, a few of those will be part of one of our favorite celebrations, and that's baptism that we do at the end of every other month. So we'll have several of those that will be baptized on that day. But maybe you're here and you began your journey with Christ recently within the past couple of months. Or maybe you've been on this journey with Christ for several years, but you've never made that faith public. I want to challenge you. Take this as an opportunity, an open door that God is in for you to make your faith public. You can sign up by going to this link right here. You can see one of us or our staff team or at the information desk. We would love for you to be a part of that day. Maybe you've got kids or a sister or a brother or someone who needs to take that step. Encourage them, pray with them. And we want to be a part of that celebration with you. I also want to let you know there's a cool event that our prime timers, uh, that's our senior adults uh, here at um, Movement Church. Our prime timers are out there and they're uh, hosting, they're sponsoring kind of a cool event that's coming up. Um, not this, is it this weekend or the next weekend? I can't get it right in my head. But if you want to see them, it's a, it's a scavenger hunt of sorts where you'll get together a team and just have some fun and then come back to the church and hang out. So if you want to be a part of that, stop by and see them. They're out there under that tent. But know that this week I'm praying for you guys. Uh, those of you who are having your best day ever, we rejoice with you. Amen.
And those of you who are right now walking through your worst day ever, we weep with those who weep. And we're here for you. And we're here to do it alongside of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.